G'day folks, Troy Dean here and welcome to another episode of the WP Elevation podcast, the show where we help you start and grow your very own digital marketing agency. My feature guest this week is my good friend from sunny Southern California, Dana Molstar from Boss Mom. Hey Dana, how you doing? I am doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you for joining us on the show. This has been a long time coming. For those that have been living under a rock for the last three and a half years, who is Dana Molstaff and what do you do and why are you here? Oh, such a good question. Uh, well, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I am the CEO and founder of Boss Mom. Um, started Boss Mom because I basically quit my job and got pregnant on the same night. Oodles of fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of those celebratory celebratory things that turns into motherhood. Uh, best thing that ever happened, though, because it was two things I wanted to be amazing at that I had no idea how to do, threw me in the deep end, and I found myself feeling very alone, very isolated. So I ended up writing a book called Boss Mom, The Ultimate Guide to Raising a Business and Nurturing Your Family Like a Pro, because I needed a community. I needed a space. I knew I was a smart, capable human being, and yet felt completely unable to make educated decisions about what I was supposed to be doing. Um, Boss Mom just did so well that we translated it into a podcast. We have now have three books. Um, we have a Facebook group that just organically hit 40,000. Um, we have over 100 cities that have local meetups internationally and just so much amazing community there. And as a content strategist, which is my area of expertise from a business perspective, um, I'm able to then help these women grow their businesses. And there's a lot of experience just from being in startups uh, for the eight years that I was in a more corporate space has allowed me to grow communities, cultivate culture, all of those things. So uh, it's one of those situations where I got a degree I never realized I would use. Um, I got this corporate experience I didn't realize would become so vital. Um, and I'm one of those lucky people where everything that's happened um, has really come to this space, to this brand where I, where I have been able to leverage a lot of my skills um, to grow an amazing community. And now it's full of so many amazing women that are leveraging their skills that we hope it's a just perpetual engine that keeps on going. And what, what did you study for the, for the benefit of those listening? Yeah, I was a broadcast journalism major. So I originally wanted to be a news anchor. Wow. And then I went and realized I was making my news reel and I got out of college and I was sending it to tiny towns like Lubbock, Texas, where I was going to get to, you know, film a cats on skates probably or something <laughs> exciting like that for 10 years. And, um, and I was working at the Brigantine, which is like a high-end restaurant here in San Diego, right next to the racetrack. And um, I had been working there in summers in between college. I was there, and there was a group of guys that kept coming in. They owned this small company um, that basically they had this like kids show, and then they were they they were coming and talking about how they were moving all of their all of their old movies to DVD back in the day, like in two thousand hmm. you know three something like that, hmm. and. Um, I had just mentioned I was a broadcast journalist. I did video editing. I knew all of those things. And so as a side job from, uh, you know, after working there, I graduated from college, turning my reel, I was being a waitress. They uh, brought me in part time. And my job was literally watching old movies, like watching old movies, watching old shows. I would uh, take the stills that became like the select scenes that you pick to mm -hmm. decide where you go huh. i'd write the blurbs on the back like design parts of the cover huh. and that was my job i got if it, if it would have actually paid any money i would have totally like <laughs> kept with it it was so much fun but then i started to see that they had all of these different ways that they could put the movies together and do all these different things and leverage different uh revenue streams with what they were doing and i brought this whole my first project uh, idea um, and they loved it and they made me the project manager and I think at that moment while I was sending out reels thinking I was going to be a news anchor reporting on news which you don't really get to be creative with mm. um, I realized like oh I want to I want to actually make things like I don't want to report on things I want to make things and mm. I think that's when I stopped sending out the reel to try and be a news anchor and decided I was going to go more of a business route so you you fall pregnant you find yourself uh looking for connection, looking for support, looking for a group, some tribe to kind of let you know that you're not crazy, that you can 
what, what's what's the tagline for the boss mom book? Raise your business and nurture your family at the same time. Is that is that the tagline? Like a pro, yeah. Like a pro. <laughs> raise your business and nurture your family like a pro. It's great. It's fantastic. I love raise your business. It's great. Um, why like? Why, why write a book? I mean, that just seems to me like the long way round. Like, why don't you just go to a couple of local meetups or go to a co-working space or? Well, I, I mean, I was a journalism major and my stepdad was a writer and my mom was an illustrator and a writer. And I come from mm. a long family of artists. Um, and I always knew I wanted to write a book and I've always, I've been brought up in a writing family. Mm. Um, so I, I was a journalism major, though. So all the English, you know, majors hated us because we don't care about grammar. We care about the story. Mm. Right. And uh, yeah, I just so writing wasn't hard for me. Writing I, I has never been hard for me. I mean, content strategy is my thing. Like I literally sit with people and they pay me a lot of money to tell them how we want to say things. Um, mm. So I, I wrote Boss Mom in 30 days. Uh, wow. We wrote it. I mean, the editing process was longer than that. I ended up rewriting the whole first half of the book because the second, second half was way better once I got better at it. <laughs> um, but it just, you know, when when it's something that is like people that have YouTube channels and they're like, Dana, just do YouTube. I'm like, it would take me forever. Like, I just don't, I'm not fast when it comes to video editing, mm. but writing I am. So a book for me was an, was an easy thing. It's only, it's, it's not a hard read. It's an hour and a half read. Um, yeah. In fact, the hard part is getting me to not write more books hmm. is to leverage the ones we have. I have to set milestones because I already know the fourth book I want to write. It's a little addictive. So you write the book, which is, you know, from everything I've learned and, and from my experience is probably about 5% of the work in actually getting a book out to market. What, how did you then market that book and, and get it into the right hands and start to get it to spread and it become so successful? Yeah. So one of the things, which is a, you know, you and I have had this conversation. We've, we've talked in your groups about, um, how to really engage, uh, an audience and how to get an audience to follow with you. Right. Because they can't follow you if they don't know who you are when <laughs> they don't know how, like how mm. to follow you. Um, so while I was in the writing process, I constantly asked people like my, I didn't know what to name the book. And so we, I hired a copywriter cause I, I was too in it and she came up with 25 different names based on our brainstorming. Um, I picked the three I like the best. Uh, we, Put it out into the market. Boss Mom was one of them, um, and we had 300 plus people in multiple different groups um, commenting on which one they liked the most. Uh, Boss Mom became the one. They helped me vote on the cover. They helped me vote on the tagline. So I was actually becoming micro famous in these other communities, which mm. is what I tell people: you know, be micro famous in somebody else's community before you grow yours. Mm. Um, in these different spaces, and I. I started to get the excitement for boss mind by everybody helping me make decisions about what it was. And then I reached out to those communities and said, okay, now the book is done. Can I get advanced readers? And I got this whole slew of advanced readers who started reading the book and gave me great feedback. And then I reached out to people and got uh, higher end people and got testimonials, the ones who had established businesses I wanted on the back um, there. And then the day that we were um basically that it was done, I started the Boss Mom podcast. So I started those at the same exact time. Um, and then we basically, the very first hire I ever had was to hire somebody to pitch me on podcasts. And from the moment the book was done, um, I was getting on two podcasts a week for the first year. And between those things and, and just some, some good coaching on how to leverage categories and Amazon and some things like that, like within, um, for the first year, we, we just leveraged it as much as possible and got everybody excited, then pushed everybody over to a Facebook group um, and really started pushing the podcast and started really making sure Boss Mom was a brand that people knew. And we just haven't stopped. Now, I've, we've been spending a bit of time together over the last few months. You spoke at our event in February in Santa Monica. And since then, we've collaborated on a course that's coming out around content strategy. And the one thing I've learned from you is you create you, you leverage the heck out of the content that you create, which is something that we're really bad at. We're great at producing lots of content and terrible at leveraging it. So what I'm curious about is how did, how did, I think the reason that I've gone down the content strategy rabbit hole is because I'm frustrated with producing so much content and then just not seeing the results that I think we should be getting from the sheer volume of content that we're producing. Mm -hmm. What got you to a point where you were like, okay, I need to take some time to figure out this content strategy thing and I need to come up with a framework that's going to allow me 
to leverage the content that I'm creating? What what was the inciting incident that got you to that point to take the time to figure this out? Because you've done a lot of work figuring this stuff out. It's not something that you've just, you spent five minutes writing down a game plan. You've spent, you've done a lot of thinking around this and you've produced a lot of stuff around this. So what, how did you get to that stage? Yeah, well, well, one thing is when we talk about leveraging content, I want to be clear for everybody listening that I'm not talking about spreading content around, right? So like a Gary Vee approach would be, I take one thing and then I replicate it everywhere and I share it everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. To me, that's not content strategy. Now that is, you know, le that's leveraging, you know, in some ways, but, but to me, unless you have a massive audience, mm -hmm. just putting it everywhere actually dilutes your ability to grow one thing mm -hmm. because you don't know where to send people, right? So, um, strategy for me and, and really leveraging isn't about more content in more places. And part of what got me there is one, um, I'm innately lazy, uh, <laughs> which everybody laughs when I say that, but I don't say it in a way that's negative. You know, I, I love working. I love, I love doing things, but I, I also feel, I don't like feeling like what I'm doing isn't actually useful right? Everything in my life is, is it useful? If it's not useful, I don't do it, including arguing and being angry at things and being mad at the world. Like the, I'm, I'm a relatively positive person because being negative just isn't useful to me. Mm. Right. So from a content perspective, I really want to sit down and say, is it useful? And how is it helping me? And which forces us to go down the, the rabbit hole, as you said, of, okay, well, how do I know if it's useful? What is it going to do for me? And one of the things I, from broadcast journalism um, as a major, which was really useful, is you learn to have conversations and listen really well to what people are saying. And in one of my corporate jobs, I actually ran focus groups. So my job was to pull these focus groups together for companies, sit them down, listen to what they were saying, pull that information out, and then help the company make decisions about next steps they were going to do about particular things. Hmm. And so I, I started to listen to an audience. And when it comes to a leveraging content, only making the right kind of content or learning from your mistakes quick, and, and then really leveraging that content in a good content strategy way to grow your business and your brand, I was able to go into my audience and other people's audiences and really quickly understand and listen what they're asking for, what the need is, what my competitors are doing, where I stand in the market. Because one of the biggest mistakes I think people make is they try to be the number one when they can't outspend the number one, hmm. right? So you got to find a way to be the most successful number two. And, it, and that's, that's not a bad thing. Like until you have the ad spend where maybe you can compete in this space. So understanding where you are and all of those things that I just started to observe helped me come up with the way that I would have a content strategy. Then I started to coach people on that content strategy and then said, okay, well, how can I translate this into something easy that somebody who doesn't think like I do, because I've been doing this for a long time, mm. you know, that they could actually use some of these tactics to really help. I mean, what we're trying to do is what you're doing here, which is, you have me on the show. I'm building authority. People are going, wow, things that are coming out of her mouth sound intelligent. <laughs> and she sounds like somebody I might want to listen to. Yeah. And I like her stories and our personalities mix. And so authority is being built. Trust is being built. Curiosity is being built. So just in what we're doing now, we are being strategic about you know a conversation. Like I, I want to have certain conversations that help my business. Mm. The more I understand what conversations I want to have in any area of my life, even from dating and parenting and all those things, you start to realize I have control over the conversations I have. And as a lazy person, the more control I have over the conversations and I can sway, then the less stuff I don't want to do happens. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And now all of a sudden, it, the living life of success to me isn't that I'm a billionaire or isn't that you know I get to do whatever I want. It's that I actually enjoy the things I do and feel as though they're not being done to me, but it feels as though I'm actually have the ability to say yes and no to things and steer things in a way that makes me feel fulfilled and happy, but still be authentic at the same time. Like, mm. so I like waking up in the morning, like, and that feels really good. Yeah. Um, it's very, you're very intentional with what you do with your content, which I feel like you, you, you're like that in, in most aspects of your life. And that's something that we haven't, as I said, it's something that we've learned a lot from you is how to be much more intentional and strategic with content. Um, I just want to touch on what you said before about being the, the most successful number two, because you can't outspend your number one. 
the value proposition for me for content, and we've grown quite a successful business here based on content, and yes, we do spend money on ads, but nowhere near as much as some businesses our size spend because we just don't want to spend that much on ads because we like making profit. We don't want to spend all of our revenue on ads. Um, so content for us, without a, really without a strategy, our strategy has just been produce as much content as possible, throw it against the wall and see what sticks, and that's kind of worked up until now. But really the value proposition for me is that if you have a great content strategy and you produce engaging content, you can build an audience without spending a lot of money on paid traffic, right? Mm -hmm. And you can get real loyalty. Like, like the big brands these days are actually scared of the power of grassroots marketing. They're scared of the power of the smaller companies getting massive, intense loyalty because then if you get enough small communities loyal to one brand you're taking the we're collectively taking a chunk out of the big brand right so that's something to, to think about is that the way that we become number one in our space is to niche into a certain space and and to recognize that we are number one to our specific cult audience mm. and that's what we should yearn to be getting is that cult audience that mm. that fiercely loyal um audience you know pat flynn talks about how to have raving fans mm. you know and that's absolutely true like mark schaefer i'm doing a collaboration um with him and these are people i partner with by the way because we, sh we share the same viewpoints i was just on pat flynn stage a couple weeks ago mark schaefer and i are doing um an event together and he is uh he just wrote the, um, uh, oh my gosh, Marketing Rebellion oh, yeah. is his latest book. Same thing, how how being a hu human work, like actually outbeats everybody else. Mm. And yeah, and so I, I think that, that as business owners, um, we want to start thinking about what conversations we want to be having. And really, it's just like you, you and I are, you say you throw a lot of content against the wall. And I, and I, but I also think that you're, you're probably way more strategic than you think. Um, that you have a, a good team, you have, you know, a lot of manpower. And so that you can do more, just like I tell people, like I do a fraction of what you do, um, you know, because I produce a lot less, I have a smaller team. Mm. But I tell the people that are like following me, you don't even have to do as much as I do mm. in order to be successful, that's right. right? Like we've grown to this stage um, and that's good. You're gonna grow and you're gonna give yourself space to play. I tell people like the best possible space to be in your business is where you have the extra funds to play around with what works, to mm. throw stuff against the wall and see what sticks, right? Yeah, yeah. Because once you've kind of carved out that space for yourself and you have that security, and you have that space, then all of a sudden you can kind of roam around and you know you can always go back to where you're to where you're at. And so I'd say, yeah, let's all build businesses where we can play a little bit more. So it's not it's not so stressful. Yeah, totally. Um, and let's be clear here. Content strategy is, you know, for those people that don't understand the word strategy, because it is it's kind of like a buzzword. It gets thrown around a lot and there's a lot of kind yes. of you know misunderstanding around it. We're not talking about copywriting frameworks here, are we? No, we're talking about the journey. A content strategy is how do we take somebody from finding out you exist to taking whatever actions you want them to take? Mm. Oftentimes, since we mm. have businesses, that would be to buy from you. But mm. there's content strategy for nonprofits that their goal mm. is to help you quit smoking or to get you to protest smoking or mm. to get you to, you know, uh, there's a lot of actual um, insanely insightful marketing campaigns that are amazing content strategy that are all about getting you to stop do something mm. stop doing something just as much as you are to do something um and so yeah content strategy is just about helping move somebody from a through a journey right and i think that's the that when you say you throw a lot of stuff to see what sticks and then some things stick you know and and that you're kind of moving towards a more conscious content strategy the conscious content strategy is this that you know why you're throwing things out there and you know mm. which part of the journey it's in mm. right which is why i think people are constantly doing stuff but it's very hard to understand what worked because they weren't sure why they did it right yeah. i made this thing i recorded this podcast I, I i talked to this person i was on this summit i collaborated with this person i did this live series and you're like okay well where did it play into the journey of what you want people to do or what you want their belief system to be or what objections you were handling or where you want them to go and a lot of times they'll be like i don't know i don't know i want them to buy my stuff and you're like well that yeah we all want them to buy our stuff but you don't want them to get to your sales page and then find out that you exist on your sales page no that's right, right? you want you want them to get to your sales page because they're about to click the button buy button and they just needed your page so they had the button like yeah. <laughs> that's what you want
<laughs> yeah. So, so what is what is if you could break down that journey in in like the too long didn't read version? What is that journey from to take someone and say, hey, you know, you're a complete stranger, you don't know me, but here I am. This is what I do. Uh, and by the way, I've got this thing you should buy. What, what's that journey that someone needs to go through to feel comfortable enough to know, like, and trust you, as they say in marketing circles, to actually give you their, their money and buy your product or service or program? Yeah. Okay. So from a from a content strategy marketing standpoint there's there's four main kind of campaigns or things we have to do so one is we have to build awareness a build awareness of trends or things that we want them to understand or to uh change the way they mindset things um those kinds of stuff like in Mm. new industries dying industries that kind of thing so what do we need to be aware of is the first part so there's Mm. this awareness the next part is authority so that the, we know that you are the person that is known in this space. So there's some trust that starts to happen there. And then the next one is to get them to actually engage with you and what you're doing in your brand. Mm. And then the fourth campaign is a conversion campaign where we actually handle objections and get them to make decisions. Mm. So those are the four main kinds of campaigns. And what they do is they move people through four a uh, four-step process, which is one, you guys have to agree that they have what problem they have. So an awareness campaign helps them go, I agree with you. This is a problem. And I have this problem. Then the second one is, okay, this problem is a priority. Like this isn't just a problem. Like this problem needs to be solved now. Right. Then we need to say, you're the person who is going to actually solve this problem, which is where the authority comes in. And then we're going to say, okay, now you can actually get me those results. And a conversion campaign includes all the social proof Hmm. and that telling them what the result is going to be and making sure they understand that the result they want for the problem you both agreed was happening Hmm. is is going to be happening in this conversion campaign. So those four campaigns are the way that we help somebody through the buying decision Hmm. so that when they, and this can happen over months, Hmm. right? If you really look at the seven figure business owners, they start seeding the topic six months before. And, you know, that and B school for Marie Forleo, it's six months before it ever happens when the little trickles of, of it start coming up yeah. and start coming up. And then all of a sudden in December, it, nobody can talk about anything else until yeah. it's like a huge storm and everybody's hoping it's over soon because the only thing anybody ever talks about is B school, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. During a particular time. And that's a very intentional flow. But you can also just do that in your day to day. You can do it that leads up to a launch or you can do it from your day to day. And for mm. all of my boss moms, for the most part, they've got small, they're small solopreneurs. Mm. Some of them, it's not even a full-time job. It's 20 hours a week. It's trying to be a virtual assistant. It's trying to be a project manager. It's being a website designer. Mm. And they don't have massive, huge companies. So the cool part is, is that if you follow this process, you don't have to spin your wheels throwing stuff out or trying to do all this cold calling, which they hate to do to try and get clients because nobody's got time for that. Mm. You know, nobody's got time for that. So, you know, everybody going, where's my next, how am I going to do ads? I've got to figure out ads. And you're like, ads won't even work if you've got cold traffic That's right. to a journey that is disjointed. It yeah. doesn't make sense to anybody. So right? nurturing has to happen at some point. So we all got to decide how it's going to happen. Yeah. And so you can do this. Let, let's be clear. You can do this with, through multiple touch points, right? You can, you can produce blog posts that do this. You can produce email, uh, email newsletters or email nurture sequences or, you know, autoresponders. You can produce, if you've got a Facebook group or, or you're in any LinkedIn groups, you can do this on LinkedIn and Facebook. It's that you, you can, you can apply this, these campaigns across multiple touch points. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and what we're doing right now is what we consider an authority platform. So a podcast, YouTube, um, a blog, you know, a book, but a book's a little more of a stagnant authority platform. Yeah. Um, and, and so you can take those platforms, you can decide what content you want based on what it is. It's all based on what it is you want them to do in mm. the next 30 to 90 days mm. is what we're deciding. So the thing you have to know is you have to know what function the thing is that you're you're the platform that you're using. So if you're going to send out an email, write a blog post, have social uh, content, it can all be on the same topic. But the idea that people say, Hey, just take this one thing and then just share it everywhere. That's not really functional because the way you would talk about the same exact topic on Instagram as a long form learning story, you're not going to share that into a Facebook group and get any engagement. You're going to share into the Facebook group and actually ask a very key question about people's opinions on that topic to get the engagement going and then reference back right you're you're in a blog post you're going to actually give a lot more information on how to do it how you know how something happened uh, or a roundup of people or something like that and then you're going to disseminate that into an email 
right? By actually giving additional information that's a little secretive so that your email group feel or your email uh, list feels like they're the inside mm. circle because we need to get them to that website because if we're really smart, then we're targeting the audience who visited that page mm. and then redirecting them to something, potentially an ad or another way that we're, you know, tracking where they're going. Yeah. So it's not about, you know, the, the strategy is about understanding the journey, understanding how the platforms, how they function best and what their use is, mm. and then leveraging those things very specifically. I'd rather people produce less content and produce it and and, and move it around in the right way. Mm. Um, you can take five ideas and have 50 different ways over a period of six weeks to promote and get people to move towards a decision than just putting out more stuff. Because I tell people consistency will actually kill will actually kill your brand, right? If you're consistently creating the wrong things. Yeah, yeah, totally. So he, here's an exercise, right? I'm, I'm just gonna, I, off the top of my head, I wanna take an example that is like probably the one of the hottest topics in our audience, which is creating recurring revenue in their business through getting clients onto some kind of retainer, right? Okay. And I'm gonna just, off the top of my head, I'm just gonna rattle off some ideas for, uh, for an awareness, uh, authority, uh, engagement, is that the third one? And then mm -hmm. conversion, right? So conversion. one of the most popular things our audience talk about is how to uh, sell what we call review funnels. So essentially it's getting a client to pay us a monthly retainer so that we can uh, help them increase their their Google reviews and their Facebook reviews. And it's all done through email okay. automations, right? So the awareness campaign might be something like just making them aware of the fact that more reviews on Google in, improves their search rankings. And right? we could just do like a blog post and send out an email telling them, just kind of reminding them or even making them aware that this is a thing, that the more reviews they have on Google, the better their search rankings are going to be, right? Yes. Then the authority piece could be, um, I, you know, uh, an episode of me on someone else's podcast talking about review funnels, or mm -hmm. uh, if I was doing it, I could um, I could point to an episode where I interviewed Phil Singleton out of uh, out of Kansas, I think he is, who kind of introduced me to the whole concept of review funnels in the first place, which shows that you know I have an authority platform, which is a podcast, and on that platform we talk about review funnels, so that instantly positions me as the authority. Right. Then from an engage, what would I do from an engagement point of view? Would I could I if I had a Facebook group, could I run like a seven day challenge to like not not no, teach them? That, there are definitely things you could do. I will just tell everybody that it's so much simpler than what they think. Mm -hmm. um, it is on the day to day engagement is where a real campaign uh, works its magic. And so what you want to do is you know the, some of the questions that we're gonna have because engagement is more about asking people than telling people mm. right mm. so in the authority and the awareness there's a little bit of the telling mm. in the engagement there's the asking right mm. so i want you're going to start asking questions like what's the last review you left and why did you leave it ah. right it's like what's the last review you received and what did it do for just how you felt about your business how did mm. you leverage that how many reviews do you get when do you ask people for reviews mm. so what you start to do is you get people answering all of these questions about, oh my gosh, I love the last review I got, I did this, or oh, I did this, or I never leave reviews, or this mm. is what is difficult for me about reviews, or easy, or whatever it is, right? And it just starts getting people answering those things, hmm. right? Or what's what's one, you know, what's the, uh, the your most favorite book that you that you read, where as soon as you put it down, you went and left a review, mm. right? So what we're doing is we're just like, how many of you make decisions based on what other people say about it? You know mm. what I mean? So you, all you're doing is creating a conversation around the value and importance of, of reviews by getting everybody to to get posts. Like we're getting we're talking in my group, mm. something like that would get hundreds of comments, mm. right? Hundreds of comments. And and because that's engaging, the algorithm in Facebook thinks you're super engaging. Everybody starts to have that conversation. And now reviews are top of mind. So engagement yeah. is less about huge challenges and things like that. It's about the little tiny things that all of a sudden they're going, yeah, I have a horrible review process. Hmm. I can think of five my past clients. I never even asked them for a review. Mm, yeah. I should probably do that. That's probably an important thing. When am I going to find time to that? Has it been too long since I've asked? Right. And now all of a sudden they're thinking about it. So when your conversion came, campaign comes out, they're like, oh, thank goodness, Troy. I was just sitting here freaking out about how I'm not getting any reviews. How did you know I needed this? And you're like, because yeah. 
hundred percent. And in this case, the conversion campaign would be, hey, you know, we're running a, you know, promotion for the next seven days where you can jump on our review funnels and there's either a special price or we're just, you know, taking on a certain amount of clients in the next seven days before we fill up and now's the time and we can help you get your reviews up and about. And because they've been thinking about this for the last four weeks and it's consuming their 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 brain space and their bandwidth, their mental bandwidth, they're thinking about it. We've kind of twisted the knife, reminded them that it's a problem, shown them the possibilities, built authority got them to engage in the process and the, and the topic and now we put the conversion in front of them and they're more likely to pay attention. Yeah, yeah. and a conversion campaign is very much about just handling objections as I, as they mm. would say in like a say, like in actual sales, right? Mm. Someone, what are the reasons why people might not buy? I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. I don't have the skills. I don't have whatever it is, right? And a conversion campaign is a lot about handling those skills. That's why case studies and stories and testimonials are so great mm. because it's proof that it is possible. It handles the objection of that will never be me because you're going to tell them people, this person was just like you and they got this result. Like, hey, I know you say you don't have time, but here's why we're going to show you that you, are, you do have time for this or this is, this is going to save you time. You know, Like, I know you're worried about skills or things like this, but this is the thing we're doing that makes your life easy. Not a good writer, we gave you the templates. So a conversion campaign mm. is is ultimately we have this card open for seven days or whatever it is, but it's, it's it, the nuance of how it actually like works converts as it should mm. is that we're handling the objection. So they, at the end, they have no reason to say no. Right. If yeah. they, it's, it's question-based selling is a whole thing. I had to do a lot of training on at one of the jobs that I had way back in the day. And it's a line of, which I learned is now what they use in. So negotiating mm -hmm. um, is a lot of negotiate is, a line of questioning where the answer is you. So if their qu answer is yes, basically, to the line of questioning, then the logical answer is you. Mm. And that's what a conversion campaign is, is where at the end, the logical answer is you. And if they say no to you, then they're going to feel like they're making a bad decision. Mm. And, like, and that's, that's the key. If you can get them there, you're the choice. You're the, who, else would they, who else would they go to? They have the problem. The problem's a priority. You're the one they want, and you can give them the solution. Why wouldn't, of yeah. course, I'm going to buy from you. Love it. Don't be ridiculous. Love it. Love it. Makes perfect <laughs> sense. Hey, I'm respectful of everyone's time, and this has been super fun, and we could do this for days, and in fact, we have. Uh, and uh, so, but in the meantime, where can people reach out and learn more about Boss Mom and, uh, and get to know a little bit more about Dan and Mole stuff? Yeah, so boss-mom.com gets you uh, to our Facebook group, to our podcast, to our books, to our resources, all of those fun things um, where you can find just all the basic content that we have that helps you uh, mainly run a business. We're all moms, but uh, you know our area of specialty is helping you run a more efficient, effective content strategy in your business and leverage your business in the right way so that you're only working 20 hours a week so that you can actually hang out with your family and mm. go to sleep when your husband goes to sleep. That's the goal for most people. It's yeah, like, yeah. I don't want to wait till everybody's in bed so I can work. I want to go to bed when everybody goes to bed. Yeah. That is the goal. Totally. Awesome. Love it. And if you're interested in learning more about content strategy, of course, you can get over to courses.wpelevation.com slash content strategy. Uh, I think the cart might be open by the time you're listening to this. If not, it will be open in a few days. We have a content strategy blueprint course, uh, which is on pre-sale for about a week, I think. So check out courses.wpelevation.com slash content strategy where you can learn more about that. Hey, Dana, thank you so much for your time on the podcast. I really look forward to keeping in touch and all the best with Boss Mom. Oh, thank you. It's been a blast. All right, folks, there you go. There's another episode of the WP Elevation podcast. Get on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review and uh, follow us on you know, Facebook and subscribe on YouTube and all the usual places. I look forward to speaking with you again on the podcast next week. Until then, I'm Troy Dean. Go Elevate.